I'm Jerry McCarthy. I'm a volunteer at the National Museum of Computing on Bletchley Park. And I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker, Sir Dermot Turing, who is the acclaimed author of Professor Alan Turing Decoded, a biography of his famous uncle. Um, also more recently, the award-winning X, Y, and Z, the real story of how Enigma was broken. Test of up for Polsku, et en plus disponible en la langue française. And with no further ado, I will pass over to Sir Dermot, if you would care to uh, unmute yourself, and you have the floor. So thank you very much. And um, uh, I'm afraid not being a polyglot like our host, um, I am proposing to speak in English, um, even though this is a tale of international cooperation. Um, let's begin with what people expect the story of Enigma code breaking to be. Uh, the traditional story as pervaded by uh, movie companies is that Benedict Cumberbatch broke the Enigma cipher after many years of sweat and hard labor in a garden shed uh, at the back of Bletchley Park. Um, well, let's see. I mean, I don't seek to challenge much of that apart from the garden shed or, or the many years of sweated labor. But uh, I think actually the real story is perhaps more interesting than the Hollywood version. And um, uh, I would um, therefore propose to begin in a slightly different place than, than that garden shed. Um, let's begin with this document, which is to be found in the UK National Archives. And it was prepared uh, in, if I remember rightly, 1938 by John Tiltman, who was probably uh, Britain's foremost uh, cryptanalyst of all time. Uh, and uh, replaced Dilly Knox as the chief cryptographer of the Government Code and Cipher School when, when Knox died in 1942. Um, so what this says, uh, and you can read it for yourselves, but in 1931, we were provided by the French with photographs and directions for use of the German army Enigma machine. And then Tiltman goes on and he says, the photographs show an attachment on the front of the machine, which doesn't appear on the model available to the public. He's referring to the plug board, which you can see in the picture of the Enigma machine. And then he goes on and says, we don't understand what the plug board does. And then he sets out a set of questions. Please can the French give us all the information they've got about all these things. The significance of this document is that as late as 1938, the British code breakers were still trying to puzzle out the actual mechanics of the German army version of the Enigma machine. They were so far away from code breaking, there was no prospect of them actually being able to decipher a single message that the Germans had sent because they didn't know the basics. They didn't know what the internal wiring on the machine was. They didn't know how the plug board fitted into the general mechanism of the thing. They didn't know what the wiring of the rotors were in the, in the machine. And, that, and without that knowledge, it would have been utterly presumptuous of anybody to start thinking about ways of finding the settings on the Enigma machine that the Germans were using uh, for encipherment. In other words, let's face it, the British in 1938 were in uh, a state of almost total ignorance. And what's more, that state of ignorance persisted until six weeks before the outbreak of World War II. I find this quite remarkable because the next thing that happens Quite remarkably, actually, let me just go back. The next thing that happens quite remarkably is that by September of 1939, so this is within three or four weeks after the outbreak of war, there are documents in the National Archives which are talking about the uh, engineering requirements that the Government Code and Cipher School has got to build bomb machines 
which would be used to find the settings on Enigma machines. This is quite remarkably rapid. They've gone from not having the first clue about the internals of the Enigma machine to being talking about building bomb machines to do precisely that thing, which I thought would be very presumptuous to do, to find settings that the Germans were using on their Enigma machine. How on earth can such an advance of knowledge have happened in such a short space of time? Well, of course, the standard answer to that is that Benedict Cumberbatch is a brilliant actor, and so he invented it all in the space of uh, uh, only six weeks. I don't believe that. The real story is much more fun, and it begins with a few of my friends who I would like to introduce you to. On the left, we have Hans Thilo Schmidt. He's a German World War I decorated uh, ex-serviceman. He had the uh, Iron Cross, don't know which class, for his uh, fighting in the trenches. After World War I, like most of the German army, he's demobbed and he's basically trying to find a job for himself that pays uh, to keep him in nice stiff uh, collars and um, look as smart as he does in that photo, which happens to be his uh, Nazi party membership uh, uh, card photo. Um, he uh, cannot find such a job, but he is lucky enough to have been wangled by his brother into the German uh, cipher office of the war ministry and he has access to the safe in which the most secret documents are kept and amongst those documents are the instruction manual and key setting uh, instructions for the German army version of the Enigma machine. And Schmidt is no fool, so he spots a business opportunity here and he walks around to the uh, French embassy in Berlin and he asks to speak to the military attaché. And he says, I've got some documents that might be of interest to the French government and I'm willing to sell them. This was quite a good career path for many German people in the early post-war years. And so the French had set up a process for dealing with people like Schmidt who walk in off the streets and uh, have stuff for sale. They get these walk-ins vetted by the man in the middle. I don't think I would have wanted to take on uh, this chap. He looks pretty damn scary. And uh, that's how most people reacted to him. This is, well, it's difficult to know what name to give him because he had about seven or eight pseudonyms um, as befits a spy master. But for the, at the time he was meeting Hans Thilo Schmidt, he was called Rudolf Lemoine. He was born in Germany, uh, had spent lots of his life traveling around South America, most countries in Europe, and his profession before he retired was that of a criminal card sharp. He would fleece young uh, people in, in casinos and try and avoid uh, being sent to prison, not always successfully. Um, and uh, he retired a rich man in the uh, immediate uh, post-World War I era. At which point, um, the natural career progression for a retired uh, criminal is uh, to be snapped up by the French security services uh, as a spy vetter. I mean, frankly, if you can uh, fleece all these innocent uh, bystanders, you're probably not a bad judge of character. And he was a good choice because Lemoine meets Hans Thilo Schmidt in, uh, in a secret location and uh, he checks him out and thinks that he might well be the real deal. What he can't do because he doesn't have the expertise is to see whether these documents that Schmidt has got for sale are actually of any use. So he calls in Gustave Bertrand, who is the man on the right. He's the head of the French Section D of the uh, Military Intelligence uh, Department. Section D consists of Bertrand and his secretary, so it's not really a very large uh, department, but his role is to buy and sell code books that might be of use to the German uh, French army. And 
So he's the natural person to be uh, brought along. And the three of them meet one day in 1932 in the uh, reception area of a hotel in the Belgian town of Vervier. While Schmidt and Lemoine drink brandy and smoke cigars and talk about the uh, forthcoming German elections, Bertrand is dispatched to the bathroom upstairs with a camera and a photographer and they take, these two chaps take photos of these books that Schmidt has sneaked out of the safe. They take photos so that Schmidt can sneak them back in the safe the next day and nobody will be any the wiser. And these documents are things like this. They are the Gebrauchsanweisung für die Schiffrier Maschine Enigma, 1930 edition. You'll see that the top right hand corner has got a white square on it and the reason is that they covered over the copy number of the uh, instruction booklet so that it, if the photographs leaked out, uh, it would not be possible to trace back the source to Schmidt uh, to know that it was he who had provided the French with this vital document. The, a uh, piece of text in the middle uh, refers to the law of the 3rd of June 1914 against military uh, betrayal and uh, 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 treachery um, and uh, tells you what um, uh, nasty things will happen to you if this particular document happens to be leaked. So this is obviously a pretty serious thing. And What's more, it's quite exciting. It's, uh, it's an illustrated document. It's got pictures, including the one on the right, which is a picture which I'm sure you can instantly tell is a picture of an Enigma machine. And it's precisely that thing that John Tiltman was referring to when he said, well, we got some documents from the French a few years ago, and they show an attachment on the front, which we don't really understand. These documents, are in the hands of the French, but what they do not contain is the detailed engineering drawings of the inside of the Enigma machine. It's a user manual, and so it tells you how to operate it. It doesn't tell you how it's wired. And so there's a problem here. Let me just stick with this slide for a second. There's a problem here for Bertrand and his colleagues, because Bertrand goes around to the code breakers in French military intelligence and says, look, I've got this amazing stuff from, from this uh, uh, spy that we got in Berlin. And they say, well, it's not really amazing, Bertrand, because it doesn't tell you how the machine is wired. And if you know what the wiring is, you're not going to break any codes. This is why Bertrand reached out to Tiltman, because he thought the British might be able to do better than his colleagues were, and they got the same answer. So his third approach, he has a third option which he can follow and that's to talk to his newly established uh, a relationship that he's newly established with the cipher bureau in Warsaw and so I want to just talk to you a little bit about the position of Poland between the wars because it's rather central to our story. In this rather horrid old German map we've got various things which I've scribbled onto it. Um, you can see the interwar outline of Poland in bright green. And you can see the current boundaries of Poland, which are outlined in black. The other lines show you what the story was before World War One. So the pink outline was the uh, boundary of the German Empire. The yellow outline was the boundary of the Tsarist Empire. And below the to the south of the pink and yellow lines is the, is the Austro Hungarian Empire. So you can see that Poland basically did not exist in the period before World War One, at least it hadn't existed for 100, uh, 120 years or so. 
So for the Poles, having re-established their nation after World War I had ended, the position was really quite crucial because they were sandwiched between the uh, albeit defeated uh, German Empire, of which you can see there's a bit, not only the bit on the left, which is, uh, sorry, to the to the west, which is um, the uh, part of West Prussia, but there's also East Prussia to the um, north of them, um, as well as the their old um, enemies, the uh, Russians, now in the form of the Soviet Union, uh, on on the east. Now this makes life quite interesting because in the uh, thing that we know as the Polish corridor, you can see that this is precisely where the Germans are going to be communicating with each other by radio to get messages from west to east Prussia. And in the middle of that, you'll find the town of Poznan, which I have uh, marked with the red arrow. And it's in Poznan that the Polish military intelligence decided to set up a school for code breakers in the mathematics department of the university there. And that mathematics department was fortunate enough to have some very bright guys attending as students in the uh, early 1920s. Uh, and these guys were deliberately recruited because some of the messages that the Poles had detected from their uh, interception station, also at Poznan, were appeared to have been enciphered on machines and therefore were unlikely to be uh, amenable to the kind of code-breaking techniques that have been used for hand ciphers during World War I. They needed, because they were machine ciphers, they needed a different approach and they thought the mathematicians would be well suited to uh, uh, tackling those problems. So sure enough, by 1933, the Poles had begun to put some of these mathematicians onto the problem of the Enigma machine uh, and the messages that they were picking up in the Polish corridor enciphered using Enigma. One of the mathematicians, the one on the left here wearing a military uniform so this dates it to much later in uh, in the war, war years but never mind this is marion Rievsky. Um, he's now celebrated as a polish hero and the reason for that is that in 1933 he was sat down in a small rather dirty office in the polish military intelligence headquarters in warsaw and he was given a commercial Enigma machine with no plug board. He was given a pile of intercepted messages and he was given the documents, copies of the photograph documents that Bertrand had brought back from Verbier and which had been lifted out of the safe by Schmidt the year before. And what Rievsky was able to do, applying the mathematical knowledge he'd acquired while at university in Poznan, was to figure out that the problem of Enigma and its wiring was a problem in group theory, more specifically permutation theory, and it was amenable to uh, being expressed as mathematical equations. And many years later, Rievsky wrote his memoirs and he set out the equations, some of which I've presented for you on this uh, slide, hoping that somebody uh, and I know Jerry is putting himself up as a candidate for this, speak Polish and also speak permutation theory and can tell me what exactly it means. Um, uh, I speak neither of those languages and so I just sit there and think, well, this is pretty impressive. However, Rievsky had a problem. There was a classic problem that even non-mathematicians can understand, which is that he had got several equations and. I think it was that he had six equations and he uh, unfortunately uh, had one additional unknown and you can't solve the equations if you've got more uh, unknowns than you have equations. So his equations were never going to be solved and without solving them he was never going to figure out what the wiring in the machine was. But then he had an idea and I'm just going to take you back to the map of Poland because 
if you think about where he had grown up in Poznan, at the time he grew up before World War I, that was part of the German Empire. And so his teachers were teaching him in German, and he knew all about the German way of thinking. And so he said to himself, if I were German and I were wiring up an Enigma machine, how would I wire up the letters on the keyboard to the place where the electricity enters the three rotating coding wheels, the rotors in the machine? I know, I'd probably use alphabetical order because that's the orderly way in which Germans think about problems. And so he tried it and that was one of his missing variables. And by trying that, he had the right number of equations and the right number of unknowns, and he was able to start solving things. And lo and behold, his guess actually worked. There happened to be 26 factorial guesses. And just by choosing alphabetical order to try it out, he picked the right one just completely by chance. It was uh, both a fantastic psychological achievement and also an astonishing mathematical one because as a result of that the Polish engineers were able to construct fake Enigma machines such as the one on the right hand side of the slide and you can see that the plug boards at the back and the keyboards in alphabetical order it's definitely not a German Enigma machine but it's functionally equivalent it's got the three rotors it's got the plug board it does exactly the same job and the Poles started making Enigma machines for themselves. And this is one of, I think, two, possibly three surviving examples of Polish model Enigma machines that um, are still in existence. So problem solved. Well, not really, because what they've done by the beginning of 1934 is create Enigma machines. What they have not done is come up with any techniques for finding the settings that the Germans use to uh, uh, effectively set the key of the day for uh, enciphering messages. There's 150 million, million, million different ways of setting up an Enigma machine. You just think about it. There's the three rotors, but you can choose which rotors to use, and you can choose which um, order you put them in the machine. That's not a large number of permutations. At the beginning of World War II, when they have five rotors to choose from, that's only 60 permutations. That's not a big deal. But then there's the question of which rotor, which letter on the rotor is going to be uppermost in the Enigma machine when you start encipherment. And there's 26 times 26 times 26 possibilities, so that's uh, 17,000 odd. Uh, again, that's not a particularly large number. Um, you could do that. It would be painful. You'd need quite a lot of people to test all the possibilities. You could do it by brute force. But the killer was that plug board. That plug board, something like 150 million million possibilities on that. You could never do that through brute force. You needed some clever way of solving the problem of the plug board you needed some clever way of figuring out by something other than pure guesswork what the settings being used by the uh, by the Germans were bearing in mind that they were changing frequently. During the 1930s, they didn't change as frequently as they did uh, after the war had begun. Um, and that was probably how the Polish code breakers managed to start to find solutions. They had enough traffic to work on using the same settings to begin to find patterns. And here's where the other two mathematicians trained at the same time as Ryevsky in Poznan uh, come to the fore. These are Jerzy Rzycki and Henryk Zygalski, shown on this slide. And these guys are the ones who can come up with the uh, really quite innovative techniques for finding Enigma settings. Ryevsky, I think, was the uh, sorry, Rzycki, I think, was the one who was principally thinking about solutions in mathematical and mechanical terms. And he certainly invented this machine 
uh, called the cyclometer, which uh, Jerry is the expert on having built a cyclometer uh, simulator. Um, and this machine was exploiting uh, duplicate letters which appeared in the uh, opening sequence of German Enigma messages. We can talk a bit more about the detail of that in the Q&A session if you like. Um, this was absolutely crucial to eliminating the vast numbers of the possible settings uh, because these coincidences of repeated letters were only confined to a very limited uh, range of uh, rotor positions. Um, I also think that Ruzitsky was the likely to have been the uh, dominant force behind the development of a more sophisticated machine, the one you can see on the right of the slide, which is called the Bomber. Uh, the Bomber was effectively a fully automated device uh, so that they could set it running and then go and have lunch and then come back and hope that the uh, machine had uh, given them some suggestions as to what starting rotor positions were actually in use at the time. Zygalski's contribution is to uh, effectively do the same job, but using punched cardboard sheets and the holes in the punch sheets, which again, there's an example on the slide, um, represent where these duplicated letters appear in the opening sequence of messages. Um, and there's a different sheet for each uh, rotor combination and um, so the, uh, and, and the pattern of holes will be different in each thing and the idea is that you uh, put on to a uh, a light box the sheets which corresponds to the uh, messages that you have observed during the day and the repeated letter sequences that you have observed in those messages and you stack the sheets on top of each other and hopefully by the time you've got enough stacked up then the light is only penetrating through one or two of the holes uh, in uh, by the by the time it's been shaded out by several sheets and that should give you an indication as to which uh, rotors are in use and which um, letter is uppermost in the at the start of the uh, encipherment process these guys have done all this stuff they've solved the problem of uh, enigma machine wiring and they've solved the problem of how to find the settings and they've solved the problem of how to automate that process by 1938 at a time when you will remember the british still are nowhere on any of those problems I've been rude about the British, it's time to introduce them. Um, here is Alistair Denniston, the head of the Government Code and Cipher School, looking rather dapper. And here's his number one cryptologist, Dilly Knox, who is looking much smarter than he normally did in real life. And he's the brain box of the outfit. Dilly Knox could actually break Enigma. He had techniques for finding settings but only using the commercial machine, which did not have the plug board and which had known rotor wiring. So he, he's pretty good, but he's not mastered this particular problem. These two guys get an invitation from the French one day. The French are trying for political reasons to get the British to cooperate much more closely with regard to the threat the French perceive on their eastern border, namely that they may get invaded all over again by the Germans. And one way in which they're trying to do that is to build up intelligence cooperation because they think that intelligence cooperation will also lead to full scale military cooperation. And what they do is that they suggest to the British that the intractable Enigma problem might well be solvable if the French and the British together cooperate with the Poles. And you'll recall that the French-Polish alliance was what had led the 
Schmidt documents to find their way to Warsaw. And it's quite clear that Gustave Bertrand, although he's not been told anything substantive, believes that the Poles have made some sort of breakthrough, which they're not telling anyone about yet. So he suggests that everybody gets together for a conference, which takes place in January of 1939 in Paris. And at this meeting, everybody gets to know each other and they shake hands and they have dinner and uh, and it's all very good. And there's, there's actually some quite positive and practical outcomes, which are things like uh, interception of radio messages in the late 1930s is a very tough business. And so the British could pick up messages that the Poles couldn't and the French could pick up messages that neither of the other two countries could and, and so forth and so on. So they agree to share their traffic and they agree to share the problems that they know about and they also agree to share any breakthroughs that anybody might happen to stumble across on the Enigma problem. And this sharing arrangement is formalized in this document that you've got here, um, which Bertrand says, uh, for greater security um, uh, and also convenience, I suggest that from here on in, we refer to each other by these code names, X for Paris, Y for London, and Z for Warsaw. And then he goes on and says, please number all your documents so that we can keep track. Um, this is the beginning of the XYZ Alliance. The Poles, you will note, haven't actually said anything to the other two allies about what they have achieved on Enigma. It's still highly dangerous for them to uh, get into all that detail. But we all know what happened in the spring of 1939, and we also know that uh, the Germans had changed their Enigma procedure, and in particular, they'd added two new rotors to the library of uh, rotors that could be put into the machine, chosen from to put three in the machine. And that had basically wiped out the Poles ability to use their bomber machines for Enigma code breaking, because the uplift from six permutations that are possible with three rotors to choose from to 60, which is choosing three out of five, meant that they needed 60 bomber machines and they only had six. They didn't have the technological scalability to build the extra 54 bomber machines. And so that meant that they, if they were to keep up their uh, ability to read Enigma, they needed to cooperate with another country that could help them with the engineering problem. So what the Poles did was they summoned another conference which took place in Warsaw in the third week, at the end of the third week of July 1939. It took place in this building on this slide. You can see this is a modern photograph um, and there's a plaque on the building on the left just behind the Christmas tree where that actually commemorates the uh, activity of the Polish code breakers who by this stage have been evacuated from the center of Warsaw and put in this building, which is essentially the entrance to a large underground bunker. And it's still a NATO military facility, which is why it's got um, uh, soldiers standing outside guarding it. Um, but basically it's the same building. And in that building in July, 1939, the Poles revealed everything that they knew about Enigma to the French and the British. Deniston brought back a document from that meeting, which again is in the UK National Archives. It's this one on the right. And you can see that it's written in German, which is perhaps curious, but this was the language which all three participating parties had in common. They all spoke German because Germany was the common enemy. And uh, people will not be surprised to know that basically the British and the French struggled with Polish back in 1939. Some, some things haven't changed, Jerry being an honourable exception to, to that uh, particular issue. Um, the British spoke French. The 
French did not speak any English to speak of, uh, and the Poles uh, did speak some French. So they could have done it in French, but not all, not all, not everybody spoke French. And so it was just easier to carry on in German. And so the list of things that the Poles divulged is in German. And if you just have a look at it, we've got some really quite interesting stuff here. Um, we've got Ruzitsky's and Ryevsky's theory of cycles, which is what led to the uh, cyclometer. We've got uh, reconstruction of the rotors, the Schiffrier Walzen. Um, we've got um, how you find the uh, cross pluggings on the plug board, Auffindung der Steckerverbindungen. Um, uh, we've got the cyclometer at number 10. And most uh, notably, we have, uh, we've got the new uh, uh, Cypher Wheels Forum 5. And most notably, at uh, number 15, we have got Die Bomben. Uh, and at 16, Das Netzverfahren. So these are the bomb machines and the theory of perforated sheets developed by Zygalski. They're giving absolutely everything away. And I think now we can understand how it was that when Knox and Denniston came back from Warsaw at the end of July 1939, so literally five weeks before World War II broke out in Poland, they have come back with enough know-how to be able to get cracking on a new type of bomb the one that we now know as the Turing Welshman bomb, as seen at the National Museum of Computing. And that is able to be put into development and therefore something that can be conceptually discussed with engineers very soon after the outbreak of the war, so that the pilot, the prototype model, is actually de uh, delivered to Bletchley Park in the spring of 1940, before Britain is fully at war. Because although Poland was defeated, we mustn't forget that there was this period of the phony war, which lasted until April 1940. And it's before the end of the phony war that that, that um, prototype, not very good prototype, bomb machine uh, was developed and delivered to Bletchley Park. So that is the explanation as to how we went from zero to world war winning weapon sorry that's too alliterative isn't it world war winning weapon in in just such a short short period it's this handover was absolutely crucial i'm just going to spend the last few slides doing a little bit of a sequel because i find it um, partly I wanted to show you this just gorgeous photo of, of the reconstructed bomb at, at, at TNMOC and to give due honour to Alan Turing and Gordon Welshman for taking the Polish concepts and pushing them on to another level. And uh, I, I, don't, I shouldn't give a talk about Enigma without um, celebrating that. But actually, the thing that I'm having sort of gone into the story of the Polish codebreakers, the question that immediately presented itself to me was well, what actually happened to them when when the war actually broke out you know surely they don't just get erased from history in, in in some way and actually their story turns out to be quite interesting i'm only going to give you a very abbreviated version because i don't want to overrun time um they escaped to france as we know the germans invaded france in uh, may of 1940 and uh the, they had to escape a second time they ended up in north africa and Bertrand rescued them from there and set up a secret code breaking facility in this chateau just uh, in uh, in Provence. It's near Avignon, um, lovely sort of touristic part of France. Very beautiful. Weather's absolutely stunning, and uh, he was working in the shadows, not and not necessarily in uh, harmony with the objectives of the Vichy government. He was still liaising with the British uh, and they were still spying on the Germans from this chateau. And you can see these photos that we've got of the Polish codebreakers doing things. There's one on a bike ride gone to the Palais des Papes at Avignon, 
we've got the beginnings of the um, uh, European Football League uh, going on in the top right hand corner with uh, I particularly like that picture because Zygowski and uh, others are playing football wearing their suits which I, I mean it's obviously proper footballing dress for 1942. Um, they've got girlfriends, Polish code breaker with girlfriend bottom left, Bertrand he's sitting on a stone stoneware jar with his wife um, and then there's all sorts of games with the uh, chateau staff there's the teenage girl who's hiding in one of these jars. i mean this is kind of it's kind of fun it's like humanizes these people i think this is absolutely fascinating what they got up to then france got invaded a second time um, just as the torch landings were happening in north africa at the end of 1942 and the Polish code breakers had to go on the run yet again. This time, the Germans had done some intelligence analysis on documents they found in Warsaw in 1939, and they had figured out that the Poles had had an Enigma code breaking operation going on, and the Polish code breakers' names and mugshots were being circulated around France in these uh, wanted lists, these things called the Fahndungsnachweis. Um, and this one from 19, March 1943 has got the names of uh, Rzycki, Rievski, Zygowski and their bosses and a whole bunch of other uh, Polish guys who are less famous uh, besides. And uh, they were trying to track them down. The March 1943 date is actually quite good for the Polish code breakers because by this stage they have got a three month um, head start on the Germans. Nevertheless, they're being chased around this part of France shown on the map. Um, the places marked with the red dots are where they had uh, close encounters and in some cases arrests uh, uh, and some of the Polish code breakers did not manage to make it across the mountains into Spain. Uh, Rievski and Zygalski did make it across. And they got to this place. If you look, the um, there's one red dot that is on the Spanish side of the border at a village called um, Puig Therda. And uh, they managed to get themselves arrested there by the Spanish and were interned for six months until the Red Cross found them and got them uh, expatriated to, to Britain. That in itself is interesting. So there's pictures of, uh, there's a post war picture of Zygowski looking like a film star um, uh, in Britain. That building behind him is a Barclays Bank, so it clearly proves that he's in Britain. Um, and uh, there's Rievski reading a book um, uh, that's still while they're in France. But these two made it back to Britain and they reported for duty to the uh, headquarters of the uh, Polish military intelligence by then established in London, who set them to work at this place, which if you take the train to Bletchley from London, you'll, um, you'll actually go past it you'll be within 200 meters of uh, where where Rievski and Zygowski spent the years uh, 1943 to 1945 uh, at a Polish uh, military intelligence signals intelligence facility at Felden um, and uh, just just outside Hemel Hempstead station which you can see marked on the map there and then you're going to ask yourselves, why on earth has Dermot Turing taken leave of his senses and he's giving a talk about Enigma code breaking and he's got a hammer and sickle flag showing there. What on earth is going on? Well, what on earth is going on is that by the beginning of 1944, the Enigma code breaking operation makes no sense for the Poles to continue because it's being done at Bletchley Park and it's being done in abundance at Bletchley Park. And so there's no point in having Rievski and Zygowski doing their own little two man Enigma show in Felden. The big threat for Poland in 1944 was what were the Russians going to do to the eastern border of Poland when the war was over? 
Were they going to re-establish Poland's 1939 borders and go back to uh, the USSR where they had come from? Or were they going to continue with the appropriation of the eastern provinces of Poland, which they had uh, carried out in 1939? At this stage, of course, Russia is a major ally of the United States and the United Kingdom and uh, the Free French. And it is not politically uh, appropriate for the allies to be uh, spying on the Russians. And certainly the Poles, who are most at threat from the Russians, cannot rely on their allies to do that for them. So Ryevsky and Zygelski are crash trained in the Russian language and put on to uh, decoding Russian messages to find out what on earth Russian intentions are. And that's what they spent the rest of World War II doing. OK, so that brings my presentation to an end. Um, the story of X, Y and Z. I will now stop sharing my screen. And uh, I think, Jerry, if you are happy to uh, moderate the Q&A part of the session, um, I should be happy to start that. OK, I suggest that if anybody has any questions, they pop them into the chat box and we will take it from there. And at the moment, it's all very quiet. Oh, Martin Gillow. OK, I'll just allow what I should do is allow participants to unmute themselves as well. Martin, who's a volunteer at the National Museum of Computing, um, asks, do you think that the Poles were expecting more help from the French British building more bomber rather than the British taking over full control of breaking Enigma going forwards? Uh, yes, I absolutely think that's right. Um, at the time they shared in uh, July 1939, the Polish calculation I think was that the British would supply the engineering uh, boost that they needed, and the French would supply the military boost that they needed. Don't forget the French army. I mean, we, we forget this because the French were defeated so quickly in 1940. But the French army was the most formidable armed force in, in Europe at the time. And all that the Poles wanted to know was that if the Germans invaded, which they were fairly confident would happen pretty soon, uh, that the French would pile in from the west and uh, subject the Germans to the most merciless military treatment that was imaginable. So that was the deal, really, that they'd get, they'd get Germany into a two-front war at the cost of the Enigma secret. Um, I think nobody had predicted that the French response in 1939 would be so pathetic, and nobody had predicted that the... Uh, blitzkrieg in Poland would be so rapid and so decisive. Um, certainly on their way out of Poland in 1939, the Poles tried to bring as much of their Enigma equipment with them as they could, and then they kept abandoning it. It was just too heavy, it was too bulky, it was too much of it. Uh, and uh, so they burnt some of it, they buried some of it. Um, and uh, if anybody's planning to visit the Ukraine, then uh, apparently quite a lot of it is... Um, uh, buried in or just outside uh, the town of um, Wish you work if I remember correctly. Yes, that's right. So that's the name of the village, and there's a town called Vladim Vladimir or something. Which uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. So uh, anybody who's got a metal detector and visiting the Ukraine, uh, apply to me, and I will try and give you directions as to where this stuff might be buried. <laughs> <laughs> from, ah. from Klaus Schmidt. <laughs> Eine interessante Frage. Yes, thank you, Klaus. Um, <laughs> what's your opinion about the movie Imitation Game, and what do I think of movies Enigma and U571, and are there others? Um, well, let's begin with are there others. So, um, Jerry and I have spent many happy hours talking about the famous masterpiece of. Uh, Polish uh, 
late communist Polish cinema, uh, which is a uh, full length treatment of the story I've just tried to summarize for you. Um, and of course, it's in Polish with Adolf Hitler, played by a Polish actor who walks into the room and does a uh, Nazi salute and says um, to, uh, to all his assembled generals. And this is not meant to be a comic moment, but I'm afraid it is. Um, so there is another movie and it's apart from some piece of nonsense, which has a sort of a not historically correct um, uh, female uh, femme fatale subplot in it. Um, it's actually pretty accurate. And uh, um, apart from its unintended comic moments, it's actually it's actually not bad as a documentary. As a piece of drama, it's pretty rotten, it has to be said. Um, uh, it, and it's extremely hard to get hold of. The other movies that you mention, um, let's just put them down in the box of, you go to the movies for entertainment, you don't go to the movies to educate yourself on history. What you do, I hope, when you go to the movies for entertainment, is you think, oh, that's an interesting story. I wonder what, what the truth of that is, and I'll go off and find out. And I think if you sort of get too upset about historical inaccuracy in movies, then you're probably missing the point about what movies are for. Um, and uh, the imitation game has got lots of uh, flaws in it. U7571 is a piece of marvelous fiction uh, and Enigma doesn't pretend to be anything other than fiction. So, um, I mean, it, they're, all, they're all fine, they're all fun, but uh, don't, don't take them too seriously is what I would say. Up the list a little, there's a question from John Gilbert. Any info on the Warsaw Postal diplomatic interception and wiring map made between 1928 and 1930? Uh, not from me, I'm afraid. I don't know anything about that. Um, sorry, John. That, um, uh, hopefully somebody else on the uh, call will be better informed than me and may be able to give you an answer in the chat box, but you're not uh, not, not, not for me. Sorry about that. And then we have from Chris Miles, do we know how much the Germans knew or suspected about the Allies' ability to crack Enigma? Just to be safe, why would they not have added extra rotors, for example, to scupper our methods? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, so, uh, uh, and I'm afraid it's worth an entire talk in its own right, but let me try and be concise. Um, the German Navy, and in particular Dönitz, had very strong suspicions about the uh, Allies' ability to crack Enigma and was resisted by his experts who told him that Enigma was basically unbreakable. The German army had the exact opposite uh, experience. The German army's experts uh, believed that Enigma was insecure because there was a danger that it might not be used correctly. And they spent lots of time trying to convince the German army generals that there were improvements in practice that needed to be uh, put in place, which if they had done so would have been a real headache for the uh, allies. And then secondly, to develop uh, technical adaptations of the Enigma machine to improve security. And those technical adaptations were eventually uh, put in put in train and uh, began to come into use in late 1944 and 1945. But then, by then it was too late. If they'd done it three years earlier, it would have been it, it would have probably. Uh, well, I'm not going to say it would have made a massive difference because by that stage the British and Americans were so good on the technical solutions um, that they may not have been knocked back for very long. But uh, um, it, it might have made it, it might have made a difference. So, so it, it's a very complex story, but it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. On Dave Harlow, did the Polish team feel protected, especially after they had reached England? Uh, yeah, that's another. I mean, that's another good good question. Um, 
Uh, um, so there's basically two answers to it. One, one is an answer to a question which you didn't quite ask, which is sort of what's the truth of the story that the Poles tried to go to Bletchley Park and were rejected. Um, that is half true, that story. Certainly Rievsky wrote a memo saying, I'm bored here at Felden and I want to um, uh, do some real stuff and can't the British uh, integrate us into their Enigma team. That went nowhere. And I don't think it went nowhere because the British rejected it. I think it went nowhere because it got lost in the bureaucracy between Polish military intelligence and MI6. And the problem was that by 1944, when Rievsky wrote his request, nobody who knew Rievsky was still around. Knox was dead. Deniston had been moved sideways to do diplomatic code-breaking. Alan Turing wasn't at Bletchley Park anymore. Uh, and these were the only uh, um, British people who'd actually met the Polish team. So um, there wasn't anybody to speak up for them. But to the question you actually did ask, were they protected? Yes, I think they were protected. I think they were looked after properly by Polish military intelligence. And it was only after the British government de-recognised the government, Polish government in exile in favour of the Soviet-sponsored Lublin government that had uh, taken over at the end of the war that things started to go wrong and it became quite dangerous for um, Polish people, particularly Polish mil military intelligence people, to go back to Poland. So it's astonishing to me that Rievsky decided to go back. He's of the people say there were only three Polish code breakers. It's not true. There were at least a dozen in the UK by the uh, uh, end of the war. And uh, I think Rievsky's, I may be corrected on this. So if somebody knows better, please pipe up. But uh, I think he's the only one that I'm aware of who actually went back to Poland. The others all stayed in the UK. Um, and uh, or France, and um, uh, that just shows what the measure of danger um, that they perceived for themselves was if they went went to essentially Soviet-controlled Poland. Um, from George Baker, uh, if the Germans knew there was Enigma decoding in 1943, why didn't they add complexity? Well, of course they did, but. Uh, well, I think I think they did. So in in the naval Enigma machines, they introduced a fourth rotor in 1942, um, uh, which caused serious setback for the British and Americans. Um, and they did introduce the Enigma Ur, which had a sort of a thing where you could basically change the settings hourly. Uh, they didn't like using it, but they did introduce it, and they uh, also introduced they were going to roll out this thing called the Look and Filler Valsa, which was a, a rotor with a variable turnover notch, um, which they were just in the process of rolling out in 1945 when the war came to an end. They were just late. They were just too late. That was the that was the real problem. And of, and of course, uh, there was this thing that they simplified the message headers so that the uh, cyclometer, the bomber, and the Zygalski sheets no longer worked, just yeah. in time for the Turing Welshman bomb to take over with its somewhat different um, uh, method of working. I'm, I'm very delighted, Jerry, that we're um, bomb coordinated today. We're, we both have bomb, um, yes. uh, bomb imagery behind us. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, from Martin Gillow again, do you have your own Enigma machine? And if not, is there one model you would love to have? I don't have my own Enigma machine. Um, uh, they're incredibly expensive. Um, so I went to an auction in New York City a few years ago and uh, uh, one sold for $100,000. So, so they're, they're not the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you pop in your shopping basket as you're going around Morrison's. <laughs> um, is there a specific model I'd love to have? Um, well, I'm not, I wouldn't be fussy. So if you're offering me one, I'll, I'll, I'll take it whatever it is. Um, but uh, I mean, I think I think the um, the interesting thing I think, which many people, unlike you, Martin, um, uh, as an expert, um, uh, unlike you, people would not appreciate that there was an entire family of different types of Enigma machine, and uh, ranging not only from the 
commercial one without the plug board to the standard uh, German Army Air Force model with the plug board, three rotor model, um, and then the German Navy model with the space for this extra non-rotating rotor. It's rather strange to have a non-rotating rotor, but four rotor machine. And then there were the special um, non-plug board four rotor uh, machines used by the Ebfair, uh, which were very instrumental in giving the British um, very interesting uh, intelligence particularly leading up to D-Day. So, I mean, all of these things are sort of iconic in their own way. So it's it, it's kind of hard to choose. So I'm, I'm, I'm ducking the question. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so we just have time for maybe a couple more questions. And there conveniently are a couple more questions from Michael. For short messages of 50 characters or so, what hardware and procedural changes could best improve security? even today, or Enigma-type machines, on Enigma-type machines? Well, so uh, the, the interesting thing is that the security improvements are all well known back in the 1930s and 1940s. It, the way that the bomb machine works is by uh, marrying up guessed at plain text content of messages with the observed intercepted ciphertext. So if you can disguise the uh, plain text sufficiently, then you uh, are well on your way to improved security. And the Germans were fully aware of this, the British were fully aware of it, and everybody basically screwed it up. So no, nobody gets any nobody gets any prizes for good cipher security. Elementary mistakes are things like don't begin your messages. So if you're a French serving officer, the only acceptable way to report to your senior officer is you say, mon général, j'ai l'honneur, you know, you know, I have the honour of presenting my report. And no report is militarily acceptable without the, that polite phraseology at the beginning. If you're going to say that, send it in plain text. Don't encipher it. <laughs> uh, then there's things like place names uh, and um, stuff like that, which, frankly, it's sensible to encode it before you encipher it and change the code frequently so that it's difficult for the um, your opponent to figure out what you're trying to say. And, and let, let's face it, the Germans were quite good at this, so they encoded um the uh position ge geographical positions in the north atlantic um first of all they used a system of uh squares subdivided into little squares rather than um, longitude and latitude coordinates and then later in the war they used uh, they had code names for particular locations in the atlantic which were uh designed to uh, disguise what their um, positions on their square grid were. So, I mean, I think I think everybody kind of knew the principles. It's just really hard to uh, put it into practice. OK, and now let's just have this last question from Rachel Lawson. Uh, when all this strange equipment begins turning up, what kind of skepticism in relation to its effectiveness did they have to deal with from people? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good one. Thank you, Rachel, for for that. Um, I think going back to Klaus's question about the uh, imitation game, I think one of the things that it it does do quite well uh, from a thematic perspective is to get across the idea that. If you're engaged in a high tech secret environment, it's going to be extremely hard to persuade people who are not in on the secret to give you the resources that you need to build this expensive cutting edge kit. And while I don't like the way that they've done that, and in particular, the way that they dressed Charles Dance up in a um, naval uniform and make him a very different character from what he was like in in real life uh what deniston was like in real life 
Um, the, the point's right. And I think there was a, a great deal of skepticism about why this obscure place that nobody would heard of should have uh, entitlements things. I mean, for example, uh, again, the, there's documents in the National Archives where the poor admin staff at Bletchley Park are complaining because they can't get can't get enough typewriters. You know, a typewriter isn't a particularly sophisticated piece of kit, but the 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 the, the correspondents coming back to Bletchley Park was sort of, don't you guys know there's a war on? Why on earth should you have priority over typewriters? Um, and, and, you know, if that's what they're getting on typewriters, heaven knows what they're getting on um, the, the other more complicated equipment. And then I think underlying your question is also the idea that isn't this material that's coming out of coded messages too good to be true and therefore we should perhaps um, treat it with a certain amount of scepticism? And I, I think you see an evolution during the war years um, with the top brass being very sceptical in 1940 about what was coming out of um, signals, intelligence and decoded messages, uh, and by the end of the war being much more receptive to the value of it, and, and in some cases perhaps being over-dependent on it. Um, so, yes, you're absolutely right about the sort of too-good-to-be-true too um, idea as well. Okay, I think that brings us to a convenient uh, closing point. Uh, TNMOC reopens physically, we hope on May 28th. Come and see the bomb rebuild and have a go on a real Enigma machine, says uh, one of my colleagues. Um, I'd also, well, I'd like to thank Sir Dermot for spending an hour and a half with us this evening. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And I'd just like to show you, show everybody, a list of the lectures which are coming up next uh, in just under one week's time, one week's time less, a couple of hours, I will actually be giving a talk about the, Pol the Bomba Polska, the Polish Bomba, which is the predecessor of the Turing Welshman bomb, of which I do have a, a simulation sitting on a table just over there. And then we have uh, Klaus Schmey and Elanka Dunin, who are going to give a second lecture on the famous and not so famous unsolved codes. And then we move into uh, various lectures following that and into May when there'll be yet more lectures. So please come back again, take a look at our calendar. Uh, you should find us online fairly easily. And I hope to see some of you next week. <laughs>